Hello and welcome to another episode of the Upper Bomb Top 3 Pen series. In this series, we ask pen influencers their personal top 3 pens. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, make sure to do that right now because I know a lot of you are watching these videos but have not subscribed yet. So make sure to do that right now. On this episode, we have a very special guest. We have an artist and that artist is even an art professor who has a YouTube channel with over 10,000 subscribers. Well, that's quite a lot. Uh, and on this YouTube channel, you can see this artist drawing with his fountain pen. So that's quite unique. The name of this artist is Mark Companiates. And most likely I will butcher his name. So sorry for that, Mark. But make sure to head over to his YouTube channel after watching this video. The name of the YouTube channel is Mark Companiates Studio. And let's have a look now at his personal top three pens. Have fun. Hi everyone, my name is Mark and I'm an artist, an art teacher and a YouTuber with a channel that focuses on pen and ink drawing techniques, drawing instruction in general, and most importantly for the viewers here, reviews of fountain pens for the perspective of an artist that uses them to draw. First of all, thank you Yous for this opportunity to share my thoughts on fountain pens with all of you. This channel has featured so many prominent people in the community over the years, people that I admire, whose channels I follow and have learned from, that this feels like an honor and a bit of a privilege. So the prompt for this top three pen series is, what three pens would you save if your house was on fire? What pens do you have the strongest emotional connection to, even if they're not the most expensive or even the best writers? This, I have to admit, is an exceedingly difficult question because while I'm obsessed with fountain pens and think they're the superior drawing instrument for any kind of line work, even though fountain pens are directly responsible for rekindling my love of drawing with pen and ink after something like a decade of using other drawing materials, I don't generally have an emotional attachment to them. To me, and I think many artists will share this attitude, fountain pens are tools, wonderfully useful tools, magically portable and versatile tools, but tools nonetheless. And a great tool is one that does exactly what you want it to and nothing more, one that disappears when you're working, becoming kind of like an extension of your hand, allowing you to focus on the task. So while I have bought pens for their looks and as an artist appreciate the artistry that goes into making a really beautiful pen, my obsession with pens is almost completely utilitarian. I love my pens for what they allow me to do, and since my objective is to make beautiful things, I don't require my pens to be beautiful. So if my house is on fire, chances are I'd probably be more focused on trying to save our expensive leather couch rather than a bunch of pens. That said, there are a few pens that I hold a strong affection for beyond their simple utility because they represent different stages of my growth as a user and admirer of pens or are somehow tied up with a twisted tangle of emotions related to making art or being an artist. Here's the first of my top three pens, the Noodler's Ahab. This is a polarizing pen that people either seem to love or hate and I'm actually in both categories. Those of you howling at the screen in indignation, I commiserate, but for artists, this is a useful pen which I talk about in detail on my channel. But we're not here to talk about practical usefulness, we're here to talk about emotional connection, and with this pen, it's this. This is the pen that started my obsession. Prior to the Ahab, I was a lowly humble dip pen user and looked at fountain pens the way many artists do, as fussy, cloggy, grandfatherly heirlooms. Then the Ahab entered my life, and my world changed forever. I'm not even sure how I became aware of it, probably through one of the many YouTube channels on sketching and it blew my mind. Fountain pens, as far as I knew, were stiff as nails, and here was a pen with a flexible nib. Fountain pens, as far as I knew, used cartridges that you had to constantly buy and had tiny ink capacity, and you could never tell how much ink was in them. Here was a pen that not only had a converter that held a lot of ink, but it had a clear body so you can tell how much ink you were carrying. Also, fountain pens, as far as I knew, were super expensive. Here was a pen that cost under $30. In one fell swoop, all the preconceptions I had about fountain pens came crashing down, and I had to. I got the pen and a bottle of Noodler's Brown, I opened the box, filled the pen, started doodling, and was underwhelmed. I could draw with it, but it was pretty scratchy even compared with some of the tipless dip pens I was used to, and when I tried to flex it, it started to railroad. That led me back to YouTube where I learned about the benefits of heat setting and why ebonite feeds were preferable to plastic ones. 
After heat setting the nib, I got the pen to flex without railroading, but the flex was underwhelming, nowhere near the incredible flexibility of some of the vintage pens I'd seen. Then, after discovering the pen forums, I learned that some people were modifying the nibs to make them more flexible. So I rushed to the hardware store, got a router, and cut little half moon shapes out of the nib, which gave it additional flexibility. I also discovered that you can easily buy a much better nib, such as the one I have in here right now, the number 6 Ultraflex from a company called Fountain Pen Revolution. Despite its many shortcomings, this turned out to be the perfect first pen for a restless spirit like me, which leads me to suspect that Nathan Tardif, the owner of Noodlers, is actually an evil genius, creating a pen with the perfect balance of attributes, good and bad. At $30, it's just expensive enough that you won't throw it in the trash if it doesn't work well, and will seek out ways to improve it. Also at $30, it's just cheap enough that you won't hesitate to mess with it. Furthermore, it's just good enough that you can see the potential of using fountain pens, and just bad enough that it makes you seek out something better. And years later, it's still the go-to pen for my obsessive tinkering. For example, some time ago I learned that you can make an overfeed for it using aluminum from a can. And at the moment, I've inserted a little pad of absorbent paper in the cap, which, when kept wet, allows you to use this pen with India drying ink without having the pen dry out and clog. There is, of course, much to hate about this pen. It burps on occasion and can't really be carried safely. But because it started my fountain pen journey, I will eternally be grateful for its existence. Its discovery really came at a perfect time, around when my son was born, and family obligations started to overwhelm my studio practice. With time in the studio becoming more and more limited, I found that the portability of fountain pens reinvigorated my sketchbook practice, allowing me to grab a pen and get some drawing in when I could. Then came the pandemic. The preschools closed, my son was home, all my classes moved online, and my studio time was crushed even more. And I think without the fountain pen, I'm not sure my art practice would have survived that very stressful period. Besides this, I learned a lot from this pen, and I think the most valuable lesson was that pens can be customized, nibs can be swished or custom ground, feeds can be hacked to make the ink flow exactly how you want it, and that with some silicone grease and a little o-ring, some pens can be turned into eyedroppers. I think for artists, that a pen can be customized in so many different ways is very appealing, since this is something we come to expect from many of the art materials we work with. Best of all, after years of use, this pen still manages to have the same vomity smell it had when I purchased it, sending me back in time like Proust Madeleine to when I first opened the Noodler's Ahab and held it for the very first time. The second pen of my top three is way on the other side of the spectrum. This is the Pilot Custom 823 FA. While this is probably the most expensive pen in my collection, that's not why I include it in my top 10 list. It's included because it represents my holy grail, having every quality I desire in a pen, a beautifully responsible flexible nib, combined with everything I want in a pen body, perfect balance, huge ink capacity, and slight transparency, allowing me to see the ink level. Pilot A23s, for some reason, are not sold with FA nibs, and though you can occasionally purchase them from a retailer in Japan, the easiest way to get one is to get the Pilot 743 FA, which is the converter version of the A23, and switch the nibs. While this is not a cheap process, I think for me, this is still a pen that is just short of being so expensive and nice that I don't feel comfortable using it, and still feels like a functional workhorse. A sturdy, well-made precision instrument designed to be used every single day. While it's not as flexible as its less expensive sibling, the Pilot 912 FA, I find that the nib is much snappier and more precise, giving me just enough flexibility for most drawing purposes. Going back to the idea that tools need to disappear, becoming an extension of your hand, this one really does. The ergonomics of this pen are just perfect, and the nib has just that right amount of flexibility, snappiness, and flow. That said, this pen has also been hacked with a feed switched out with one made of ebonite. So far, we've been talking about functionality. Now let's talk about emotional connection. I'm a fan of classical music, and I've always been extremely jealous of musicians that use beautiful instruments, while visual artists are relegated to using stuff like this, an ink caked nib holder. I usually keep this pen in this very nice zippered case made by Sonnenletter, along with this lovely Kaweco Special Brass 2mm clutch pencil. 
And I guess this for me reproduces that feeling that musicians must have when they open their cases and see their gorgeous instruments. Pen and ink drawing, in some ways, is akin to musical performance. A great drawing requires every stroke to be perfect, the right length, the right strength, all in perfect coordination with every other stroke. And even though every drawing I've ever done falls short of that perfection, the act of taking this exclusive pen out of this case inspires me to strive for it. The last pen in this top three series is the Kaweco Sport Brass, a pen that has been an everyday carry since I got it and one that I've grown very attached to. A big part of this attachment is, again, practical. My studio, as I often mention in my videos, and as you can readily see, is a messy place, full of solvents, paints, palettes, not an ideal environment for a delicate fountain pen. I also enjoy working outdoors, also not an ideal environment. Having something that can withstand rough, dirty environments is really indispensable for most artists. This pen is also special to me for another practical reason. True to my restless tinkering nature, I've improved the limited ink capacity of this pen by making this simple squeeze converter from an old ink cartridge and a silicone ink sack. And now this pen holds twice as much ink as the short international ink cartridge it's supposed to use. But best of all, I've also switched out the original nib, which is perfectly functional, but nothing special, with a delicate, precise, flexible vintage gold nib, making this pen an almost perfect combination, an indestructible modern pen body paired with the unbeatable performance of a vintage gold flex nib. Which leads me to the emotional connection I have with this pen. I'm getting close to turning 50, and I think my generation was the last to grow up in a mostly mechanical world at least in the Soviet Union, where I was born and spent my early childhood. My toys were still made of wood and metal, and some of them were in retrospect pretty dangerous, like a little motorized lathe complete with razor-sharp chisels. I remember playing with my grandfather's typewriter, a trophy taken from Germany after World War II, with all of its intricate levers, hammers, and springs. And even though it was from the 30s, it was no antique, but a practical machine that saw heavy and daily use. The nostalgia for that analog time, with its often beautiful yet rugged machines, is somehow embodied in this pen, which, though it's only a few years old, somehow feels like it belongs to that distant era. And while I also have quite a few antique pens that also have that nostalgic pull, I find myself only using them once in a while, playing with them, cleaning them, and putting them away. Most of them are fantastic writers, and I love drawing with them, but they're simply too fragile for regular use, whereas this pen gets used almost every day, and then gets thrown into a bag and even my pants pocket with the house keys. I hope all of you enjoyed seeing my top three pens as much as I enjoyed making this video, which is unlike most of the practical stuff on my channel. And of course, if you found any of this interesting at all, please consider checking out my channel, which has tons of pen reviews, tutorials on how to hack your pens, and pen and ink drawing instruction.